Welcome to Stock Explorers and welcome back for another deep dive. Great to be here. Today, we're uh, really zeroing in on beam therapeutics. They're right at the cutting edge of genetic medicine. Absolutely, a fascinating company. And we wanna focus particularly on their work with Beam 302. That's the one targeting alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, or AATD. Yeah, AATD, yeah. it's a big target. We've gone through the recent updates, the science, the timelines, trying to pull out what's really relevant, especially if you're you know, tracking this space for potential opportunities. Right, and the goal is to make some pretty complex stuff clear, maybe even a bit captivating. Exactly. So Beam Therapeutics, founded back in 2017, based in Cambridge, Mass. That's right. And their whole thing is precision genetic medicine using something called base editing. Okay, we'll definitely need to unpack that base editing part. <laughs> but first, the people behind it, some heavy hitters, right? Oh, definitely. You've got Feng Zhang, David R. Liu, J. Keith Young, all big names from the Broad Institute of MIT and Harvard, real pioneers in gene editing. And that probably helped with funding early on. You bet. They raised a pretty substantial Series A, um, $87 million back in 2018. And before they even went public, they'd pulled in nearly a billion in venture capital. Wow. Okay. Yeah. And then the IPO itself in February 2020 brought in another $180 million. So clearly there was a lot of belief early on in what they were trying to do. So their core mission is really about precise gene editing for therapies that could well, change lives. Precisely. And their values, innovation, collaboration, integrity, diversity, all point towards that goal. Okay. Let's get into that core technology then, base editing. Yeah. You said it's different from the standard CRISPR-Cas9. Yeah, it really is. Think of CRISPR-Cas9 like molecular scissors. It cuts both strands of the DNA. Base editing. It's more like a pencil. A pencil? How so? Well, it makes very specific changes to single letters, single bases in the DNA code without making that double strand break. And why is avoiding that double break so important? Uh, because those double strand breaks rely on the cell's own repair mechanisms, which can sometimes introduce errors like unintended insertions or deletions. Base editing by avoiding that break could potentially lead to fewer off-target effects, fewer unintended consequences. It's designed for higher precision. Makes sense. So how does it actually work? What are the components? It's basically got two main parts working together. First, there's a modified CRISPR protein called a nickase. It doesn't cut both strands, just one, think of it like a very accurate GPS guiding the editor to the right spot on the DNA. Okay, so it finds the location, then what? Then the second part, a demonase enzyme comes in. That's the actual pencil tip, if you will. It performs a direct chemical change on a specific DNA base or letter. And there are different types of these pencils. Exactly. There are two main classes. You have cytosine base editors, CBEs, which can change a C into a T. C to T. Got it. And then adenine base editors, ABEs, which change an A into a G. A to G. So just yeah. those two types of changes, C to T and A to G. But that covers a lot. It covers a surprising amount. Estimates suggest that these two types of edits could potentially correct something like 37% of known genetic mutations that cause disease. We're talking maybe around 30,000 potential targets. 30,000. That's uh, that's massive potential. It really is. Okay, so let's connect this tech back to Beam 302 and this alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, ATD. What is ATD? So ATD is a genetic condition. It mainly affects the liver, where a faulty protein builds up, and the lungs, because they don't get enough of the protective AT protein. And Beam 302 is Beam's lead program targeting this. Yes, exactly. It uses what are called lipid nanoparticles, LNPs, to deliver the base editing machinery directly to liver cells. LNPs. Like tiny delivery vehicles. Kind of like tiny fatty bubbles, yeah. They can carry the base editor safely through the bloodstream and into the target liver cells. And the specific goal for ATD? The goal is to correct the specific mutation called the Pi-Z mutation. It's the most common one that causes severe ATD. So by fixing that one letter? Right. By changing that one incorrect DNA base back to the correct one, the aim is twofold. One, reduce the toxic buildup of that faulty ZAT protein in the liver. Uh-huh, which causes the liver damage. Exactly. And two, increase the production and circulation of the correct functional MAT protein, which is needed to protect the lungs. Okay. And we've actually seen some early results for Beam 302. There was news earlier this year, right? March 2025. Yes. Initial data from their phase 12 trial, specifically from the first dose level tested, the 60 milligram cohort. And what did that show? Was it promising? 
It was quite promising, yeah. The key finding was that patients achieved, on average, 91% corrected MAT protein in their blood. 91% corrected. How does that compare? Well, it actually exceeds the levels, usually around 80% seen in people with what's called the MZ genotype. They have one normal gene and one faulty one and generally have a much milder version of the condition or sometimes no symptoms. So getting above that MZ level is potentially a really good sign. It's definitely encouraging. And importantly, they also saw a corresponding decrease in the mutant ZAT protein, about a 79% drop by day 28. And safety. Hmm. Any red flags there? Their reported safety profile was favorable. No serious adverse events, no dose-limiting toxicities in that cohort, which is obviously crucial. Absolutely. And this data helped them move forward in the U.S. Yes. Following that, they got FDA clearance to start trials here in the U.S. That was also in March 2025, a big step. Okay. So that was the 60 milligram dose. Mm -hmm. What's happening now and what are the next steps for Beam 302? What should we look out for, say, for the rest of 2025 and into 2026. Right, so the trial is ongoing. They're now evaluating a higher dose, 75 milligrams, in Part A of the study. Part A focuses on patients primarily with the lung aspects of ATD. And when might we see data from that 75 milligram group? Preliminary data from that cohort is expected sometime late in 2025. Okay. Then they plan to present more complete results from both the 60 milligram and 75 milligram cohorts together, probably at a medical conference in the second half of 2025. Makes sense. Yeah. What else is planned for late 2025? Also in the second half of this year, they expect to dose the first patient in Part B of the trial. Part B, what's the focus there? Part B is focused on AETD patients who have mild to moderate liver disease associated with the condition. So lo looking more directly at the liver impact. Got it. And then looking into 2026. In 2026, the plan is to have the final data readouts from both Part A, the lung-focused part, and Part B, the liver-focused part. And that data will be key for what? That combined data will be really critical for figuring out the best dose, the optimal dose, to take forward into the larger pivotal phase three trials. Right. The ones needed for approval. Exactly. And one more thing for 2026, they're planning to get their manufacturing facility in Research Triangle Park, North Carolina, fully activated. Ah, uh, yes. The manufacturing piece. Crucial for scaling up. Absolutely essential for making enough of the LNP product needed for those later stage trials and eventually, hopefully, for commercial supply. So let's look further out. Assuming things continue to go well in phase 12, what's the potential timeline for those pivotal trials and actually getting regulatory approval, maybe 2027 to 2030? Yeah, that's the projected window. They're looking at potentially starting a global phase three study somewhere in the 2027, 2028 timeframe. And what would that phase three trial need to show? It would likely need to hit endpoints related to both the liver showing a reduction in that bad ZAAT protein and the lungs showing an increase in the good MAT protein. Okay, both aspects. Correct. And if they can show that this correction is durable, you know, lasts for a significant period, say 12 months or more, they might be able to get breakthrough therapy designation from the FDA. Which could speed things up. Potentially, yes. It can expedite the review process. So when could they actually file for approval? The biologics license application the BLA submission to the FDA is tentatively slated for around 2028 or 2029. That would need solid data, including probably 24 months of follow-up on patients. And they'd likely file elsewhere too. Europe, Australia. That's the plan. Parallel submissions to the EMA in Europe and the TGA in Australia. And if all goes according to plan, launch. A potential U.S. commercial launch could be on the cards around 2030. Targeting that PZ population. Mm. How many people is that globally? The estimate is around 235,000 people worldwide with the PIZZ genotype, the most severe form. So a significant unmet need. Definitely. Now, are there any sort of strategic things that could help beam along this timeline? Maybe advantages they have? Well, one key thing is platform validation. Successfully showing in vivo base editing with Beam 302, meaning editing inside the body using LNPs that really helps build confidence in their whole LNP delivery approach for other liver targets they might have in their pipeline. Right. It proves the delivery system works. Exactly. It de-risks things a bit. Then there's the potential cost advantage or maybe value proposition is a better term. How so? Current treatments for the lung aspects of ADT involve augmentation therapy, regular infusions of AT protein. It's expensive and it's lifelong. If Beam 302 works as a one-time, potentially curative treatment... It could be a game-changer economically, not just clinically. Potentially, yes. It could disrupt that existing market. And one other point, they have another platform called Escape with a program Beam 103 that's aimed at making conditioning regimens for cell therapies easier. 
There might be some synergy there down the line, perhaps for other approaches to ATD, but that's more speculative. Okay. Of course, no drug development is without risk. What are the main hurdles or risks we should keep an eye on for Beam 302? Safety is always paramount, number one. While the initial data was good, they did note some temporary low-grade elevations in liver enzymes in some patients. Okay. Nothing serious, but something to watch. Exactly. It just highlights the need for careful long-term monitoring as more patients are treated and followed for longer periods. Makes sense. What else? Competition. It's a hot area. Other companies are working on ATD therapies, too. Wave Life Sciences has WVE006, Arrowhead, and Takeda have Fezerserin. Yeah. So there's definitely competitive pressure. Right. They're not alone in this space. No. And finally, manufacturing complexity. We mentioned the new facility, which is great, but making these complex LNP therapies consistently at high quality and at the huge scale needed for commercial launch, that's a significant technical challenge for anyone in this field. Yes, yeah, scaling up is never trivial. Assuming they navigate these challenges and get approval, what about getting it to patients? What might the commercial strategy look like? Cricing. Yeah. Access. It's early days, but looking at other potentially curative gene therapies, the pricing discussions often fall in a range, right. say maybe $450,000 to $650,000 per dose. Wow. Okay. That's a lot. How do payers handle that? That's the key question. Beam will likely need strategies to address payer concerns. One possibility is outcomes-based agreements or rebates, where the final price is somehow tied to how well the therapy actually works for patients long-term. So pay for performance, essentially. Something like that, potentially. And for global access, they'll likely try to leverage the clinical trial sites where they've already been working. Building on those existing relationships in different countries could help streamline access post-approval. Okay. Let's shift to the financials behind all this. How is Beam positioned to actually fund all this R&D and the path to commercialization? Their financial position looked pretty solid as of the end of last year, end of 2024. They reported having about $850.7 million in cash, equivalents, and marketable securities. And how long is that expected to last them? The projection is that should be enough to fund their operations and these key development milestones, including pushing Beam 302 forward well into 2027. So they have runway for the next couple of crucial years. Seems like it. And their spending shows the commitment R&D expenses were nearly $96 million just in the first quarter of 2024. That's serious investment. And that includes the investment in the manufacturing facility, too. Yes. That $83 million figure over five years for the North Carolina facility is part of that overall strategy to support the pipeline. Let's talk a bit more about that facility in North Carolina. Why is having their own manufacturing so important? It's strategically huge. It gives them direct control over producing the materials for clinical trials and, importantly, for future commercial supply if Beam 302 gets approved. Control over quality and scale. Exactly. Quality control, the ability to scale up production reliably, and ensuring they meet all the strict regulatory requirements, FDA, EMA, GMP standards. Having it in-house provides that oversight. And the location. Research Triangle Park is a known biotech hub, right? Yes. That gives them access to a skilled workforce, potential collaborators, a whole ecosystem that understands biotech manufacturing. It's not just about the building. It's the location, too. Plus flexibility. Definitely. Owning the facility gives them more operational efficiency and the flexibility to adapt production as their pipeline evolves or as market demands change. And, you know, it's expected to create over 200 jobs locally, which is a nice side benefit. Okay, so wrapping this all up then, as we finish this deep dive on Beam and Beam 302, what are the main things our listeners should take away? I think the key takeaway is that Beam is really pushing the envelope with base editing. Beam 302 for ATD looks like a very promising application of that technology. Showing potential for a single-dose treatment. Exactly. A potential single administration that could modify the course of the disease. The early clinical data, while still early, is genuinely encouraging hitting those correction targets for the protein with a decent safety profile so far. And a clear path forward. They seem to have a well-defined roadmap, yeah. Ongoing trials, plans for phase three, the manufacturing build-out, targeting regulatory filings in the coming years, and aiming for that potential 2030 launch. So success here would be big for ATD patients. Hugely significant for them, absolutely. But it would also be a major validation for the whole base editing field. It shows this precise technology can work in vivo and could open doors for many other genetic diseases. It really feels like we're watching a potentially powerful new class of medicines being developed. Thanks so much for breaking all that down for us today. My pleasure. Always fascinating to discuss.
And thank you for joining us for this deep dive. If you found this valuable and want more analyses like this, please do subscribe to Stock Explorers. Give us a like, maybe. Yeah, hit that like button and definitely turn on notifications so you won't miss our next exploration into the companies and technologies shaping the future.